There we go. Okay. So thank you so much for coming here today to Angelman Updates. And uh, this is Dr. Gilles Tave, and he is a visiting Angelman Updates today. Uh, I'm interviewing him. My name is Dr. Terry Jo Bichelle, and I'm a neuroscientist, but I'm also the mom of a 22-year-old son with Angelman syndrome. And what we're doing is uh, asking scientists about their research so we can really understand a little bit about what they're doing. So Dr. Chave, you are speaking to us from France, is that right? Yes. So tell, if you can introduce yourself, just tell us a teeny bit about you, that would be fantastic. Okay, yes, we, I am a scientist in the Northeast of France, close to the German border. It's a town called uh, Strasbourg. And uh, we work in a big institute, which is dedicated to molecular biology in general, uh, and in relation to uh, human diseases or syndromes. And in this, um, in our lab, we work with two main uh, topics. Uh, one, which is more, uh, which has been for more years, is about uh, uh, the, the viral cause of cervical cancer in women. Mm -hmm. So this cancer is due to an infection by a famous virus, which is called papilloma virus. And we've been working many years on, on the on the proteins of the virus, which are involved in generating the cancer in women. And we do what is called structural biology, where we study uh, at the level of atoms, uh, the mode of action about pro of proteins from viruses. But, in, in the, but recently we have also moved to the second topic of research, which is uh, related to the the, the, how the proteins uh, participate to uh, Angelman uh, syndrome. So uh, that's so interesting. So you first were working on cancer structural biology yeah. about cervical cancer. And there, a lot of the families might not realize that the gene that causes Angelman syndrome, UBE3A, used to be called E6AP and in the cancer business, it's always called E6AP. And there used to be a lot of researchers doing cancer research on E6AP and a lot of researchers doing Angelman research on UBE3A and the two never spoke to each other. And here yes. you are doing both. Yes, we, we actually came to uh... Uh, research on Engelmann syndrome via this famous protein. So, because we started to be interested in its structure uh, for the sake of the cancer studies that we were making. And then we started to be interested more and more in the protein. And that's how we started to uh, think about uh, how it's uh, impacting uh, 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 the people in the uh, Engelmann syndrome. So, uh, we slowly shifted to this second research topic. So interesting. That's fantastic. So just so I don't want to scare families. So now that we've mentioned cancer and Angelman in the same conversation, can you explain the role of UBE3A, otherwise known as E6AP, in terms of cancer, so they understand why we even, why the two are connected at all? So the, the two are connected in a way that requires the infection by this particular virus. So when the papilloma virus comes in, uh, it would uh, produce, uh, it would produce a few proteins and including them, there is a viral protein, which is called E6, hence the name of E6AP for UB3A because E6 recruits UB3A which is, or E6AP, which is a protein from our body, huh, which we produce ourselves. The viral protein uh, binds to this human protein and together 
they make uh, what is called the complex and uh, uh, this formed complex now binds to another human protein uh, which is called p53 and this p53 protein is very essential in our body to protect us from cancer and the result of what we call this tripartite uh, uh, complex with one viral protein which is called e6 and then ub3 and p53 the result is ub3 uh, starts to put on p53 these small tags which are called ubiquitins and these ubiquitins are a signal in our cells for destruction. So, and this is something that UB3A can do to other proteins, but because of the presence of the viral protein, it suddenly does it on a new target, which is not familiar normally for UB3A in humans, which are not infected by the virus. And in this case, the P53 protein gets suddenly destroyed in our cells, in the infected cells, and, in, uh, and this participates to the uprise of cancer. But this cannot happen in the absence of the virus. So the role of UB3 in Engelmann syndrome is totally disconnected to, from this particular activity, uh, which is pushed by the virus. So I just wanna restate that and make sure that uh, I understand. So what you're saying is that if someone gets infected with human papillomavirus, which is usually called HPV, because yeah. people know about the HPV virus. vaccine. And yeah. so if, if someone's infected by HPV, then what's, what's how that brings UBE3A, the Angelman gene into it, is that it connects the the protein from the hpv virus to this other protein called p53 which is a really good it's a great protein for human beings because it kind of gets rid of cancers and yeah. so p53 is really great and yeah. so the problem is when somebody gets infected with this hpv and it kind of glues together the ub3a and the p53 and yeah. then the funny thing is UB3A does its job, which is to tag proteins for destruction, which yeah. is always what UB3A is supposed to be doing. But this time it's tagging the P53, which is the good thing. And it's getting rid of the P53. Is that right? Yeah, we call it actually hijacking. So we say that the viral protein is hijacking UB3A, you know, and drags it and say now you make a job on 53 <laughs> and it's like a, a sort of aggression from the viral protein which puts together uh, these two proteins from human that normally shouldn't meet and this uh, 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 brings 53 to destruction so wow it is, uh, it is a phenomenon of uh, viral hijacking that's how we call it wow so uh would there be then a good thing about having not enough UBE3A in that case? That if you didn't have the normal amount of UBE3A, would you actually have less tagging of the good P53? And so you might have reduction in cancer caused by the human yes, papillomavirus? This is actually possible, but you know, this would happen uh, more in this other uh, syndrome, which is the Prader-Willi syndrome, because we know that uh, the <clears throat> in Engelmann syndrome, the, 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 the deficit uh, in UB3A is in the brain. And the brain is not the target for the papillomavirus. Papillomavirus uh, is targeting uh, mucosa, mucosa only. So it doesn't go to the brain, and this means uh, in the rest of uh, the body, uh, the, you know, the UB3A is present uh, in uh, Angelman uh, people. So by contrast, um, in Prader-Willi syndrome, the opposite syndrome, then there is a, maybe a deficit of UB3A in the rest of the body. In this case, uh, it uh, might be more relevant. But anyway, it, it's very different. Uh, uh processes in the two cases 
So it's really interesting. It's you're you're trying to understand. So let me just start over that question. So as as a structural biologist, what you're trying to understand is what is the shape of each of these proteins that they can fit together? Yes. And so how could that help people with Angelman syndrome? How could the shape of UBE38, how could, could you change it in some way? Yes, so, so we have, uh, in our lab, we have two uh, matters of interest. The first one is what I said, spoke about before, the, what we call structural biology, which means to, to uh, let's say, to look at the really fine detail of the form, the shape of a protein, this is point one. But the second point that we are very much interested in is what we call interactomics. Interactomics means the network of friends, you know, a protein can have. And we are very focused on this at the moment as concerned UB3A. So our interest is to see not only UB3A itself, you know, which shape it is and how it works by itself, but to whom it speaks in our brain. So who UB3A is meeting, what are the preferences of UB3A, you know? So we try to find a list of friends and then we see who does UB3A prefer. And in this, in this direction, we went to another protein, which we call ERK2, which is called ERK2, which is a, a companion of UB3A. And then we focused on this friendship between these two proteins because ERK2 uh, is a very strong companion of UB3A. And in addition, when there are mutations in ERK2, there is uh, something which is called a very rare syndrome, which is called Angelman-like syndrome. So the people who have mutation in ERK2 uh, have sometimes similar, some similar features as the Angelman syndrome people. So, this means these two proteins meet, and in some way, the perturbation of one protein or the other protein can give a similar, uh, uh, let's say, uh, similar syndromes. So then we are very focused on this uh, uh, companionship between these two, two proteins, and we are focusing very much on this. That's so interesting because we, I remember when, uh, because I've been in this field for 20 years now, I remember when HERC2 was found as the cause of Angelman-like syndrome yes. and um, how it's so much more rare than Angelman syndrome. And actually, I think it was increased in the Amish community in exactly. um, the United States. So it um there were little pockets of communities where there was more of the herc2 mutation yeah. so that's so interesting so so basically what you're doing is you're you're trying to figure out who ub3a hangs out with yes what yes. other proteins ub3 hangs out with and in figuring that out, one of the main things you figured out was how it hangs out with HERC2. That's like its best buddy, yes. which explains why if there's something funny about HERC2 and it doesn't fit right with UB3A, then it's not going to, the two of them, whatever they do together, they're not going to be able to do it right because they're yes. shaped differently. They're not going to, well, what did the two of them do together? Does anybody know? So... Uh, in, in fact, <clears throat> we are not, um, we, this would be interesting to know, but the first thing we want to know is what happens when one of them is missing, okay? So we know that uh, in Angelman syndrome, UB3A is either missing or defective, okay? Mm -hmm. So in this case, we think our hypothesis is that, you know, this association, which we know is, let's say, uh, important, let's say, for norm, let's say uh, regular development of the brain, then this association is going to be disturbed in persons which don't produce UB3A in their brain mm -hmm. or produce defective UB3A in their brain. If this association is missing, our hypothesis is that 
you know, UB3A disappears and R2 is still waiting for partners. Mm. So what we have started to look is um, the, let's say the, the replacing partners, which now will replace UB3A. So we, we have said, okay, if this hand of R2 is now left alone, mm. it's gonna possibly catch other proteins in the brain. And mm. this will create what we call a network disequilibrium, you know? Mm. So since one partner is missing, there is a sort of redistribution of the partnerships in the brain. And this is our hypothesis. So, okay, UB3A has been missing. Now R2 is catching other people. And we have looked and uh, let's say uh, determined a, a few, a few uh, potential new partners which come into play when UB3A is missing. This is our strategy. And we say, we may understand uh, better what happens in an um, Angelman syndrome situation when we know better what R2 is capturing in the absence of UB3A. So this is our strategy. And then would that be the same kind of strategy to figure out if you look at HERC2 and if HERC2 is mutated, then what is UB3A doing? Who's it hanging out with? It's yes, yes. We, we also looked at this, but I must say, it seems that um, it's not uh, reciprocal, let's say, we have seen that uh, R2 is like at the center of the, the story. Mm. And you know, it's strange because we used to put always UB3A at the center. Mm -hmm. When we think about Engelmann syndrome, UB3A uh, is the gene which is mutated, right? Mm -hmm. So, but in, in the case of this, um, uh, of this network perturbation strategy, actually we turned out to put R2 at the center. Mm -hmm. And we know that UB3A is one possible partner and we have defined like eight or ten other ones which can you know come into play when ub3 is missing so somehow we shifted the focus on r2 as a central agent in this story wow so we shifted a bit uh, to r2 actually of course this doesn't mean ub3 is irrelevant far from it but it's actually it's because it's missing or defect then other associations can form. And we think these associations which are forming, which are not the, the, the correct associations, mm -hmm. they may drive the, some of the, let's say of the disturbance which happens uh, in the development. Wow, so interesting. So does HERC2 have anything to do with cancer like UB3A does? Uh, R2 is actually a huge protein. It's, uh, let's say, uh, five or six fold bigger than UB3A, which is already a big one. So R2 is what we call a giant protein. Um, so it has hundreds of connections on different proteins. Uh, it's uh, highly connected. Uh, many partners have been found. I can cite a very important, I mean, there has been very good work on this uh, R2 in particular by a, a famous group in Harvard who has also been very good on uh, UB3A. It's a group of Peter Howley in Harvard. They did very good work on R2 to define all the binders of R2. R2 is very involved in many connections. So, mm -hmm. and it's a protein we have in our whole body. So it's not only in brain. Yeah? So, but what we really like to focus on is the place of R2, the little part which is binding to UB3A, you know, the, the, the special hand of R2, which binds to UB3A. This is our target. So, okay, so it's almost like HERC2 is like this octopus with eight different arms yeah, reaching out, or octopus. 80 different arms, reaching out for all these different proteins. And so if the mutation is in the one arm that reaches out for UB3A, then it, it can't bind to UB3A. And then the person grows up and seems a lot like somebody with Angelman syndrome. Uh, that's not uh, exactly like this because what, what uh, the mutations that have been found in R2, it was either you know, deletion on, of one allele. Eh? We have always have two copies of R2 gene, like two copies of UB3A. And then one was uh, disrupted 
uh, this has happened or uh, there was a mutation, but it's not necessarily at the, in, at the region which binds to UB3A. But uh, for this, we think that even if the mutation is elsewhere, it can also disturb the way R2 binds to UB3A, you see? That's what we call distal effects. Wow. Uh, to, be, to be simple, if I say, I mean, you know, there is this joke that you take the heart of uh, an animal and it doesn't run, so you think the heart is the legs, but the hearts are not the legs, but the heart is necessary for the legs to work. So I see proteins uh, much like this. So, you know, you don't necessarily touch to uh, need to touch a particular region to make an effect far away from this region because proteins are like a bit like us. They, they have a lot of connections, which make that uh, even a, a distal region is sensitive to a change here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. So how do you do all this? Are you doing this in cells or, or mouse models or just chemicals in a dish? How are you doing this? Yeah, so our basic um, uh, way, as you said before, is a structural biology. This is a, so we use a, a method which is called crystallography, where we look at the proteins are very high, uh, like with very high uh, spectacles to see all the details. But uh, we also use uh, other methods, uh, which uh, consist in, uh, let's say, measuring uh, the binding, uh, how to say this, the, the strength of association. So if this is your friend, how strong is this friend? You know, so we are very much on this, uh, which we call interactomics, where we, we want to know what is a friend of this protein, another protein which is a friend, and then which degree of tightness is uh, for this friendship. So this is uh, what we call quantitative interactomics. Then we also uh, work in cells uh, more and more actually. So in our group, we were not familiar with cells, but recently in the last years, because of this project, we have started to, to work more and more with cells and actually we enjoy it. It's uh, very interesting. So we move to cell systems, the living cells, and we see what happens when we disturb something in them. But wow. this is actually, I must say it's new for us, but we, we moved in uh, because of the Engelman project in particular. Ah, that's fantastic. So your project is funded by both the Angelman Syndrome Foundation and the Dupe 15Q Foundation? Yes. Uh, that's uh, great. Q, uh, audience. Yeah. Great. So um, you, uh, how did you manage all that during the pandemic? Were you able to keep working or were you yeah. able to, how? Um, in our lab, we had the, the allowance to go on working, uh, you know, so it was very nice. We, we, we were not very disturbed. We had a few months where we uh, slowed down, but during these few months, we worked a lot on the computers. Uh, so finally, uh, this work on the computer was also very useful. The, the part of the discoveries we make are based on using the computers. So. We were not really, I wouldn't say we have had uh, trouble with working and then we could come back to work and then work regularly like before. Wow, so, you know, One thing that we cannot do is of course to travel as much as we did before. So it's more about Zoom meetings like we are doing now. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. Right. So I could ask you a million more questions. I'm fascinated with what you're doing. I, I, I know our time is up, but I um, would just like to have you maybe, I just wanna say that this kind of shows how really basic science is important. And that if you understand the shape of a protein or how the atoms interact, it's something that we might not understand might lead to a treatment, but it might be the missing part of the puzzle. It might be exactly what we need to know that will lead to a treatment for Angelman syndrome. So um, anyway, I just wanna thank you for doing this work because it's really, really interesting and it might even help with cancer too. Yes, maybe, but uh, as uh, you said very clearly, 
I mean, we, we are more on the on trying to, to get a basis for understanding, then, you know, the, this is our step. We, we try to understand more. We hope that maybe with this understanding, some clues about also some clues about some of the symptoms, maybe, you know, when we find these friends, uh, which are involved with the R2 ub 3 a system, maybe uh, some of these proteins are more directly involved in some aspects of the symptoms. So maybe this could help to, you know, to, to help for some or other uh, aspects of the symptoms also to say, oh, this was this pathway, then we can help, you see? But this is for the future. Our part is understanding. Well, Dr. Trave, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this work and thank you for explaining it to me. And I look forward to maybe talking again in six months and yeah. finding out if you've figured out any more friends for UBE3A or mm -hmm. HERC too. So maybe. that'd be fantastic. So thank you so much. And we'll, I hope we talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.